My name is Brian Larkin and I'm the History Department Chair. I'd like to welcome all of you to, tonight, to tonight's Take It or Berg Society event on student empowerment in a time of challenge. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to point out that we're holding our very first uh, Take It or Berg Society event that has both an in-person and a virtual audience. Uh, and so please bear with us if any glitches in the technology arrive. It's a little complicated. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the Take It or Berg Society, uh, it's an association of history students, alums, and faculty, and every semester we hold one public event like this. Uh, the Take It or Berg Society proudly affirms the value of studying history. We know that, as everyone knows, that only by studying the past can we fully understand the present. Therefore, history students are particularly well prepared to lead because they've studied how the present came to be. And because they've studied how the present came to be, they can, they're excellent leaders because they can imagine, imagine better futures and strategies uh, and devise strategies to arrive at those better futures. In a sense, they are the empowered in times of challenge. Of course, by studying the past, history students also develop the analytical skills and habits of mind that prepare them for meaningful careers and engaged citizenship. Now I can go on about this a lot because I'm a history professor, uh, but at every Tegeter Berg event, uh, Tegeter Berg Society event, we bring in an alum testimonial. And tonight's uh, testimonial is gonna be given by, a, uh, is by Steph Hag. Uh, she is a particularly appropriate um, presenter for uh, tonight's event. She wrote her history uh, senior thesis slash honors thesis um, about the St. John, St. Ben's campuses, Catholicism, and the anti-war movements in, uh, in, at St. John, St. Ben's from 1965 to 1968. Her title was War Lust, and unshaven and unkempt individuals. Now, I don't think she was referring to any of tonight's panelists, the alum panelists will be uh, talking with us, but uh, that was her title. Um, after she graduated in 2018, uh, Steph earned a master's degree in library science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she now works at the, as an archives technician at the National Archives in Washington, DC. And we're very happy to have Steph with us tonight by Zoom. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Brian. Uh, as was just said, my name is Steph Haig. I graduated from the College of St. Benedict in 2018. I double majored in history and English with a concentration in creative writing. Uh, the history department at my time at CSB SJU became my home away from home. I spent countless hours there sitting in offices, talking to people. Uh, there, my love of, of not only history was fostered, but also my love of learning, writing, and critical thinking. And also, maybe less relevantly, but just as importantly, my love of cats. At CSB, my passions were encouraged. I was given the opportunity to study with wonderful professors like Beth Wengler, Ken Jones, Ellie Perlman, and others. But I also got to get to know professors emeritus like Professor Atkins, who was a reader on my honors thesis, and to work with incredible staff members such as Peggy Roski, the archivist at CSB SJU, who I am 90, who I am fairly convinced is the only reason that the institution is still standing. When my path after graduation led me to the University of Wisconsin for library school, in my pursuit of my dreams of working in archives, it was my experiences at CSB that carried me through. Not only the academic foundations that I had gained in terms of the classes I took, but also in knowing when to ask questions, how to do my own research, how to think critically, and how to apply what I had learned about the past to shape the present. Through graduate school and through my time afterwards, I have used the lessons I learned in the history department to propel myself forward. 
the jobs I have worked, the school I've gotten into, the friends I've made, none of them would have been possible without the history department. I have carried St. Ben's with me wherever I go. The liberal arts has given me a strong foundation and the professors gave me tools to continue to build as I go forward. The connections I built in my four years at St. Ben's with my professors and classmates have shaped me. The National Archives, where I work now, has a motto carved into the side of their most public building. I don't work in that building, but it's a good motto anyways. What is past is present. Every day we see that in action. History rippling forwards into the present, shaping our lives and the lives of people around us. And a good history department like CSB SJU, they prepare you for that every day. And so with that, I am happy to introduce the panel that we have here today. Welcome to the Turgerberg Society. All right, thanks, Steph. Uh, now, just a word on format. Uh, we'll begin with a brief introduction uh, provided by Professor Ken Jones on the larger context of the late 1960s and early 1970s. Afterwards, Professor Jones and Professor Shannon Smith will moderate our roundtable discussion with our four alum panelists. And I apologize to our uh, panelists and moderators right now because I'm going to keep introductions really, really brief so that we can save time for the roundtable itself. Um, Suffice us to say that our four alum guests will tell us more about themselves during the roundtable. So for right now, I'll just say that they were all student leaders who participated in campus activist movements and after graduation went on to excel in a variety of meaningful careers. Our alum panelists are Patricia Radloff Welter, class of 1970, David Van Lanschut and Chester McCoy, both of class of 1972, and Nancy Frost of Belmont, class of 1974. Our presenters or our moderators are both history faculty uh, members. Dr. Smith teaches classes on 19th century US history and the history of protest, race, and gender. Dr. Jones, uh, who just retired last year from the history department, is coming back uh, to be with us tonight, taught classes on 20th century US history. And it's Professor Jones who will uh, begin the evening with some context. Please welcome Professor Ken Jones. Okay, uh, there are people in the room. This is lovely. I, so I, it's a, a great feeling. You're gonna hear some great stories from our panelists about being students here in the late 60s and 70s. Uh, but when we were talking about this, we realized that we're gonna have sort of a diverse audience with people here and people uh, on Zoom. So we thought that maybe it would be better for me to start with uh, spending a few minutes uh, reminding you of the larger context. So I'm gonna do that now as quickly as I can talk. Uh, hang on to your hats. Uh, for decades, UCLA has surveyed, oh, well, that didn't work out, uh, one glitch right off the bat. Uh, for decades, UCLA has surveyed co incoming college students from across the country on what they expected to get from a college education. Uh, thank you, Adam. I'm glad we got somebody paying attention to this. Okay. And... Uh, I, the first set up there should have been up there to see and, and then the second set coming up later, but we'll do it this way. Uh, the top set being very well off financially are the responses of the 2018 survey. Uh, so financial uh, success is key. If you go back 50 years to 1968, that's the bottom group. Develop a meaningful philosophy of life coming in at the top of their bracket of questions. So. What I wanted to suggest to you from the start was an understanding that in the aggregate at least, students in the classes we're looking at tonight came into college with different expectations than students coming in 
today. So put that into the basket as you're thinking about this. So how does this play out? Let me start with the idea of education for a meaningful guide to life. The first significant challenge to college authority in the 1960s came with the free speech movement in Berkeley in 1974, 1964, excuse me, and this is their central complaint. You all can read, I'm not gonna read it to you. This is what they put on broadsides. Bottom line is education should be personally meaningful to the student and the institution has a responsibility to adjust curriculum and pedagogy uh, to fit that goal. More broadly, students all across the country in the late 60s challenged what they saw as arbitrary, unnecessary rules that limited their autonomy. And we'll hear more about this uh, from the panelists, I'm sure, but I gave you a, a partial list of things that irritated them and that they challenged authority on. Those who know the stereotypes of the 1960s, I'm sure, know that finding oneself rather than pursuing material success was a key focus for young people who joined the counterculture. Now that might mean dressing funny, uh, it might mean music, it might mean drugs, or it could mean going completely off the grid into subsistence agriculture, but money is not part of this picture. For many students in the late 1960s, pursuing a meaningful life meant a commitment to socially transformative action. In this, they were often following the example of their slightly older siblings, who in the first half of the decade had sought to end the legally mandated segregation that was the norm in the former Confederacy. These predecessors put their lives on the line by doing freedom rides where they risked time in a Mississippi uh, jail uh, in order to push the Kennedy administration to enforce a Supreme Court ruling, or they stood up to police intimidation in Birmingham and in other Southern cities to challenge Jim Crow laws. Those efforts to sh help shift public opinion and led Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And you can Google this if you want to know the details. So I uh, would just remind you that these things happen. Together, these two pieces of legislation ended state and local laws that had previously mandated segregation and exclusion in the South. Now, Dr. King, oh, rats. Uh, I'm sorry, I had these set up so they were flying in and that's not working, but that's the way it goes. Uh, old people should not be allowed to do these things. Uh, <laughs> King, as you, oh, that's not even in line. Uh, let me tell you what that slide says. It says there's a public opinion poll in 2011 that said that 94% of Americans approved of Dr. Martin Luther King's actions, that we thought he was a good guy. What I wanted to try to tell you with this was that we weren't always that positive. In 1966, only 33% thought that he was somehow valuable, proper, worthwhile. Uh, now, why so low? Why 33% in 1966, and yet we, we have him walking on water, uh, basically, by 2011? Uh, one reason is simply ongoing racism. Uh, a poll in 1968 asked, would you vote for a qualified, qualified candidate, uh, African-American candidate of your own party? And you can see the first number there, which is really disturbing. 53% uh, said, I, I would vote for a qualified black person of my own party. 47% uh, said no. If you want a little optimism, jump to the other two lines, particularly the 2019 line, a glimmer of hope. Okay, and get this stuff out of the way. Okay, the negative white reaction uh, was also spurred by the fact that blacks outside the South were not benefiting from those pieces of legislation. They were running into what we now talk about as structural racism uh, and their frustration launched destructive riots that occurred in the summer of 65, 66, and 67. And white people got, eh, we don't like this very much. Uh, furthermore, Dr. King got more challenging. He went into Chicago in 1966 and pressed for integrated housing in Chicago. White people who said, oh, it's okay if you get the right to vote in Mississippi said, you're not moving into my neighborhood. Uh, so you get this kind of reaction. King also raised the stakes further. Uh, in late 1967, he launched the Poor People's March, uh, Poor People's Campaign. Uh, 
and came up with sweeping demands for change in that. Let me give you a sense of what that $30 billion annually for a real war on poverty means. At that point, we're spending $2 billion a year on the war on poverty. We're spending $21 billion a year on the war in Vietnam, and he wants 30 for a domestic war on poverty uh, and all those other things. So he's asking for the moon at that point, and a lot of Americans said, forget it. Okay. Uh, Almost all of you know that black students occupied the St. John's president's office briefly in November of 1970 in support of demands for more funding for black cultural, uh, black cultural center and for programming. Here's about the best picture we have of that sit-in. I mean, if you're ever in a sit-in, take, take some pictures. I mean, this is terrible. You got one guy's face picking, peering out from the window of the president's office. We'll hear more about this from the panelists, uh, but I wanna point out that the action that, that was going on here is part of a tradition. For example, in 1969 alone, black students occupied administrating offices at the University of Minnesota, at Duke, and at Cornell, all demanding more focus on what they often referred to as Africana studies. Cornell is the only situation where guns were in evidence. Uh, they came in with shotguns and bandoleros of, of shells. Uh, but photos like this one, even though it's anomaly, it's not what other people did, it certainly brought home the sense for a lot of people that the war in Vietnam was coming home, that people were bringing guns uh, into our discussions at home. Okay, and with that segue, let me shift to the war in Vietnam. Uh, boy, those are all out of line too. Uh, you can see in the slide the arc of numbers of regular U.S. combat troops in Vietnam. Don't pay attention to the numbers, just look at how they go from 17,063 uh, to 475 uh, and uh, excuse me to 540 and then uh, drop down slowly uh, as it goes on. As you get that many Americans fighting in Vietnam, you're also going to have more American casualties. Uh, take a look at 1968, 14,000 uh, several weeks that year we had over 200 killed uh, in a week. Uh, and as those numbers continue and you don't get a conclusion, people begin, to have different attitudes on the war. Uh, I hate the way this question is asked, uh, but let's just focus on, on that no column. Basically, the no column says, uh, we think it's a good idea to send troops to Vietnam. Uh, historians don't get to choose the Gallup polls. I mean, they do what they want to do, and, and we get whatever they leave us. Uh, look at what happens to that no column. Uh, almost two thirds of Americans say, hey, it was a good idea, let's go. Uh, in August of 65, this is a few months after we first sent the first combat troops in. By December of 67, we're down to basically an even split in Americans. Uh, the, the negative number's gone up and the positive numbers come down. Now, students had a particular reason to be thinking about this passage of the war, the changes in the war. Uh, because of the draft, and let, I know this is going to come up, so let me try to clarify this now because at least in my classes, students are often confused about how this all works. Uh, the selective service system that we had from the end of World War II on uh, said that all males were eligible to be drafted at 18, uh, but there were tons of exemptions and deferments, uh, and college deferments were a huge one. Uh, people, uh, as long as you were in college for most of this time, uh, you could be deferred from the draft, but by 1968, we need more and more bodies. Uh, and so we said, okay, you can't have more time to go to college. You get four years, and if you're not done, tough. We're gonna draft you. Uh, so that's the situation that people are looking at as that war gets to its real peak. The lottery system, that whole thing with the numbers and your birthday and that stuff that some of you know about, uh, doesn't start until 70. Uh, it ends all deferments and most exemptions. 19-year-olds uh, are called up on the basis of a random drawing of their birthday. So they know right away at the beginning of the year, I'm likely to be drafted because I got a really low number or I'm likely to, to stay away from the war because I got a very high number and draft calls probably won't get to that. Uh, so you sort of winnow out who has to worry and the middle group is the ones uh, that are continuing uh, to be upset. Now, okay, um, go. Okay, uh, if you are a college student and you're worried about this, uh, some are gonna respond with p going to peaceful demonstrations like this one, and others are going to get into politics, uh, initially supporting uh, 
SJU 1935 graduate, uh, Senator G Eugene McCarthy. Uh, he decided in late 67 that he was going to challenge the president of his own party for the nomination for the presidency, a suicidal mission, uh, but he went for it. Uh, the New Hampshire primary at that time was the first one and basically one of the very few primaries that were out there. Uh, and so McCarthy went off to New Hampshire and took students with him uh, to campaign there. Now, while the campaign was going on in New Hampshire, uh, the enemy in Vietnam launched a massive attack, attack over the Tet Lunar New Year uh, in January and February of 68. Uh, it, they broke into territories we thought we'd secured. And since many Americans believed that we were winning uh, and that you know, we were getting close to the end, uh, people were really shocked by this. And they thought, oh, okay, wait a minute, we got to figure out something else. This is not working. Uh, and you can see the impact of that in this poll. The first number up there is the one I already showed you. And then look at what happens to the numbers in the next two. Uh, within a few months after the Tet attacks, which are January, February of 68, you can see we've gone uh, to 54% saying it was a mistake. Uh, and that trend is just gonna continue. Please notice the last line on there jumps a few decades. Uh, April of 1995, we're up to saying 72% this was, said this was a dumb piece to do. Uh, so we've, we've sort of baked that in at least to parts of our politics. Okay, uh, Tet was just the first surprise of 68. Uh, McCarthy managed a relatively close second place finish in New Hampshire that shook up the political system. Robert Kennedy then jumped into the race for the Democratic nomination as a peace candidate. And then at the end of March, Lyndon Johnson announced that he was not gonna run for reelection. Uh, he was gonna give up that shot in order to focus on peace negotiations. Huge change. The next month, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, again, a highly vocal opponent of the war as well as an advocate for, uh, for people of America. In June, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. With that added on top of John Kennedy's assassination in 1963, it seemed like we descended into a hell where we killed our leaders. A British tabloid looked at it this way, uh, which I thought really captured it beautifully. Oh God, not again. Vice President Humphrey is gonna ultimately uh, claim the Democratic nom uh, nominee. Uh, he got it without uh, acting in it or enrolling in any primaries, but that was the norm at the time. We didn't use primaries to, to choose people. For many young people, however, it seemed like proof that the system was rigged. Uh, the bosses seemed to choose who was gonna be the leader and they simply ignored the people who'd voted for peace candidates. While the Democrats held their convention in Chicago, the police attacked the demonstrators and the media. The official report at the end of this uh, wrote that it was a police riot rather than a person, you know, citizen riot. Uh, but for many Americans who watched this on television, it seemed like we were so broken that the Democrats couldn't even hold a convention. Nixon then won the presidency, campaigning on the beautifully encouraging slogan of bring us together again, making us feel like we could come back together but he governed with divisiveness. The war continued with larger and larger protests. Uh, Nixon promised he had a plan to get us out and that he was winding down the war. And you saw, if you remember, the numbers start to come down after 1968. But by the end of April 1970, he announced that we were gonna expand the war into Cambodia. We're gonna move into a new country. There were huge protests across the country uh, at Kent State, the National Guard was called in and they panicked in the confusion. They shot into protesters as well as students who were simply changing classes and four were killed. The other tragedy of those few days came in Jackson State and HBCU uh, where police fired into a dorm stairway. You can see all the bullet holes in uh, the shielding on that. Uh, they killed two students who were simply standing in the stairwell, looking out at cars passing uh, down the road on the edge of Jackson State. And as I'm sure you can you will hear from the panel, uh, it's these incidents, Cambodia, Kent State, and Jackson State, that will finally bring, uh, for the first time, a substantial contingent from CSB and SJU into St. Cloud to protest the war. Okay, we've looked at protests in response to educational barriers, racism, and the Vietnam War. I want to turn now to one last thing, and that's protest 
against the stultifying gender norms uh, that had especially strengthened in the decades after World War II to keep women subservient. These people, the national, leaders of the National Organization for Women, uh, got together in 1966, but they were pretty quiet. Uh, they were working on sexism in the workplace, not a lot of, of publicity. What got the publicity for the first time involved this. Uh, this is the Miss America pageant. The Miss America pageant was huge at the time. Everybody watched it on TV. It was on Saturday night. All the, covered, everybody watched it. Uh, and people went to protest it in 1968, and they said, hey, wait a minute, this is like a cattle auction. This is like doing the livestock judging at the state fair, which I absolutely love. Uh, but you're doing this to women rather than uh, to animals. And so they put all kinds of items that they saw as uh, indicative of female oppression into a freedom trash can, uh, girls, bras, uh, hair curlers, makeup, that sort of thing, uh, anything that degraded women by emphasizing their physical appearance rather than all of their other qualities. As the women's movement got moving further along, uh, some of the barbs got sharper. Uh, if you have a second to look at those, uh, they're wonderful. Uh, nasty even, uh, but very powerful. Uh, and they focused on the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, an effort uh, to use governmental action to change the Constitution to ensure that uh, gender equality was baked into everything that we do. Here's the whole text, um, one sentence, and you can see at the bottom, it passes the House and the Senate overwhelmingly in 1972, and I don't know about the other people in this room who were paying attention at that time, but I think most of us thought, oh, that's done, we're good. Uh, but you know, you need three quarters of the states to ratify a constitutional amendment, or if you didn't know that, you know that now. I just got reminded, and it goes out there and it dies. Uh, by the end of the decade, it's dead. Now, despite the failure of the ERA to make it into the Constitution, the women's movement of the early 70s does have a lot of really, really important successes. <coughs> Let me point quickly to three. The Equal Employment Opportunity Act put pressure on large employers to hire women. The absence of women was now seen as prima facie evidence of discrimination. Uh, you all know Title IX, uh, Educational Amendments Act of 72, that has to do with athletics, but more, I think equally importantly, it has to do with discriminatory practices for graduate schools. There were quotas on the number of women who could go to graduate schools. That was no longer legal. Uh, this opens the door there. And then the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, excuse me, uh, ends a whole set of banking practices where male bankers used assumptions about women, oh, they're gonna go get pregnant, that kind of thing, uh, to deny them access to credit cards and capital instead of looking at their, at their actual credit status like you would with a man. And then, as I'm sure you're aware, there's the issue of whether or not a woman can, can control uh, her reproduction. And let me start before abortion and go back to contraception. The first really workable, easy to use contraceptive, the pill was approved by the FDA in 1960. Uh, most physicians limited access to married couples uh, initially, uh, and some states denied it uh, to anybody. Uh, said, no, we don't want anybody to use it because it will encourage promiscuity. The Supreme Court struck down the state restrictions in 1965 in Griswold. They, this is the famous right to privacy idea that we're now attacking uh, and saying that it's not, not in the Constitution. Uh, they said that the, there's a right to privacy that means that states can't restrict access for married couples. That comes in 65. Lots of physicians in some states continued to say that if you're unmarried, you cannot get a prescription for the pill. That barrier goes down in 1972. Uh, so it's extended to the unmarried. And then we get to row 73. Uh, I don't think you can see that as well as I was hoping. All the red means no abortion period. The yellow is abortion on demand. And the green and the blue are abortions with considerations. So if you look at this map, I mean, we're, people are reeling now with the, the recent decision but if you were on the other side in 73, think about what this does. This transforms the universe for people who are on that side. Uh, it's, it's a shocking moment in that sense. Uh, 
and moves things in a different direction. All right, uh, a minute and a half more. Let me finish with a very brief mention of two other social transformations that begin in this era, but are gonna have bigger ramifications later. And I, you didn't give me 70 minutes or so, 80 minutes, so I couldn't do, couldn't do more. Uh, the first real visibility for the gay rights movement comes in April of 1970. Notice I said visibility. Uh, there was, the Stonewall riot in New York City was the year before, uh, but gays were still sort of under the radar for the most part. Uh, but in 1970, they had Gay Liberation Day parades in New York and Chicago and LA, so coming out publicly. Uh, and lo and behold, three years later, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexu homosexuality from its list of mental disorders. Up until that time, it had been on the DSM, a mental disorder. Uh, and then there are two events in 69 that are generally seen as helping awaken Americans to the threats to our environment. First, the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. This is the river, and yes, it is burning. Uh, it had so much oil and other pollutants in it uh, that there was a substantial fire. Now, this wasn't the first time it had come on, but it was one of the biggest ones. Uh, and people sort of said, oh my God, what's that? Uh, that's what we've done to our rivers. And also in 69, there's an oil well off the coast of California that blows out, which led to millions of gallons of oil washing up on Santa Barbara's previously pristine beaches. Uh, and those events are going to spark interest uh, in Earth Day. The first Earth Day is in April of 70. And the Nixon administration is going to follow that tide and pass a lot of environmental legislation, not because Richard Nixon really loved it, but it was something that was popular and he didn't really care very much, so go ahead and do it. Okay, uh, that's it. Turn that back over to you. And you'll sh shut that off for me. Thank you, Ken. I am going to ask our panelists to please come forward and our moderators to please come forward. I'm just going to switch some uh, camera uh, settings around right here. And then we'll proceed with our roundtable discussion. Yeah, we we don't need to be in the middle of the screen here. So. Ken, thank you so much for uh, that excellent context. I think it probably jarred a lot of memories for a lot of people. Um, so we briefly are just going to sort of move through and we'll semi stick with a chronological order of when people were here on campus. And to start off, I'd love for all of you just briefly to give us an idea of what it was like when you arrived on campus, um, what were some of the challenges or restrictions, the frustrations that you had when you first arrived? Um, and Pat, we're always going to be picking on you to start us off. So if you could start us. And, and, and to, Pat, remind them when you came so that they... um, I came to St. Ben's in 1966. And I came from North Dakota, a town, uh, Bismarck, about the size of St. Cloud. I came from a Catholic high school, um, which was a lot more open than St. Ben's was when I came here in 1966. When we got here, um, I guess I would say that um, while I was happy to come to St. Ben's for a lot of different reasons, I was pretty shocked at the, the constraints and the restrictions that, um, that we had to deal with. Now, as freshmen, you know, many of us got together and we started laughing about it. We made jokes about it. Um, so just as an example, um, our evening curfew, we had to be in our dorms at 7 o'clock. If we, um, we were supposed to go to church on Sunday, and when we went, we had to wear these black gowns. Um, when we went down to the cafeteria, which at the time was very different, of course, than it uh, was even a few years later, 
there were um, there was a certain way we were supposed to act. I mean, it was more like a finishing school than than uh, what we, you know, considered as a college. Um, I was used to a curriculum that was a little bit more um, open and and um, you know we discussed a lot of different things, um, which was kind of interesting because I, a lot of the the people in the when I was in high school came from St. Ben's, um, but they were a little bit more open and progressive in terms of their thinking about things. Um, I lived in what, for those of you Bennies who understand the, the old building, uh, the two top floors of the main uh, building were uh, dormitories. And it turned out that as, as you know, uh, minimal and restrictive as that was, it was wonderful. Uh, because we kind of formed our own little community and snuck into the convent, you know, at times at night and made a lot of fun of a lot of the restrictions. Um, the coursework um, was pretty, again, traditional um, and sort of the awareness of what was going on in the world at the time, at least for us, and I'll remember we're freshmen, um, and many people were from the area coming here, um, I thought was not not too uh, broad. Um, so um, our, our, our uh, campus area consisted of Mary Hall the, the, uh, and the two dorms on either side of Mary Hall, the old building, and the BAC. Oh, and we had a little gym. That was it. That was the that was the campus. Our we didn't have a student union. What we had was kind of the living area in Mary Hall, uh, and I don't think at the time there was even a little snack cafe at the time. So there was a smoker up in the row, and so some people got together, even if you didn't smoke, because that was the place where you could have interesting conversations. Um, I think I'll stop there. That kind of gives you a sense of, of the feel um, of it all. Thanks, Pat. Chester and then David, do you want to tell us about what things were like when you arrived? Sure. Um, can you hear me back there? OK. I'm Chester McCoy. I am um, born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I lived in uh, what we call back then the ghetto. Um, I was Catholic. I attended St. Afonso's Church in St. Louis. So when I came to St. John's, I wasn't unfamiliar with Catholicism. Um, however, I was a little bit unfamiliar with being around that many white people. <laughs> I was a little anxious. But, um, but my mother had instilled in me, like, you know, you can do this, Chester. Uh, this is a great opportunity. It's going to be wonderful. You know, you always can come back home but don't come back if you, if you quit school. So she gave me this kind of mixed message. Um, St. John's was a bit of a culture shock. Uh, you know, it was, just, it was just kind of hard to adjust to being in, um, in central Minnesota. Um, later on, when uh, more black students from St. Louis came, we, we always joked with each other and talked about, oh man, we're gonna have to learn how to cross the streets again when we go back home. Because, you know, St. John's has no traffic lights or anything like that. Um, there were some things that I found really interesting about St. John's. First, I got my own bed. I didn't have to sleep with somebody else. And secondly, you can have as much food as you wanted. I was like, this is good. I think I like college. I think I'll stay. And, and despite the challenges, and there were many, um, I, you know, I had a pretty good experience here. I had um, some uh, really interesting teachers. I had um, people like uh, Tom Thole for sociology and Jim O'Leela for anthropology, Catherine Colhane, Cy Tyson, uh, Bill Cofell, Ingrid Anderson, mm -hmm. you know, Coleman O'Connell. Yeah. Um, and although I didn't have classes with this fellow, Aiden McCall was a big influence for me. <laughs> Some people might disagree. He was the dean of students back then and somewhat controversial. And he was the um, only black faculty member that I can remember during my time at St. John's. Some came later, but I had, I, I had graduated in 1972. So I 
wasn't um, educated by uh, a black professor at, during my time at St. John's at all. Um, do I have some regrets? Sometimes, most of the time I'm pretty happy. I wear St. John's gear. I'm happy to tell people when they ask me, where'd you go to school? I say, hey, you ever heard of Lake Wobegon? Yeah, 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 we've heard of Lake Wobegon. I went to school there. Mm -hmm. I went to school in Lake Wobegon. So, and um, one last thing in terms of challenges, um, I would often refer to my ride on the Greyhound because I rode the Greyhound a lot between St. Louis and St. John's. Oh Lord, riding a dog, you know? Right. I see some people not, you know what riding a dog is like, you know, I'm like, oh, Lord, have mercy. You got to get on that Greyhound. And I rode that dog for 16 hours. And I would say when I would leave St. Louis, go through Illinois, I was OK, because then I get to Chicago and I'm like, OK, great. But once I left Chicago, it was like going through the twilight zone. And in just as the reverse, when I left St. John's and going back to St. Louis, same thing. And I would try to explain to people at St. John's, particularly my white classmates, what St. Louis was like, they didn't believe me. When I talked to people from St. Louis about St. John's, they didn't believe me. So I was left like, well, am I really there? Am I having this experience? And, you know, obviously I had an experience. I survived. And um, the last thing I want to say about that is um, I didn't know it at the time, but I was being instilled with the Benedictine values. And I recently read some of the Benedictine values. And I thought to myself, you know what? This is a pretty good way to lead your life. I don't really want to follow him. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is David Van Landshut. And I was a typical St. John student. I graduated from Pequot Lakes High School, graduate with 45 kids. 20 boys, 25 girls. I was a star halfback on the nine-man football team for about five minutes before I broke my ankle. <laughs> I played sports there, obviously. Uh, knew about St. John's. Uh, was raised in the Catholic faith. Um, never have considered myself religious, but I consider myself spiritual. Might be a fine point, but it's my point. Um, I applied to St. John's and nowhere else. I knew that this fit me, why? Well, up at Pequot Lakes, I actually lived on Cross Lake, uh, which is part of the Whitefish chain, is, and is in the woods with lots of pines. I was used to boating and fishing and being that type of country. So when someone say, well, you're gonna be behind the pine curtain for education, it didn't matter to me. Well, you're gonna be in an all boys school. Well, I wasn't planning on getting involved with girls because I had one way to get out of my situation in a small town, get an education. I wanted to go to law, get through college and I want to get through to law school. I'm surprised St. John's even accepted me, um, but I got a good look scholarship for $500 a year and that helped me. You know, the tuition and books and room and board was about $2,600 a year. That was real doable back then. Um, real motivation factors, because we had the college deferment from the draft or from uh, you know, yeah. going into Vietnam, that was huge. There's no question you've already heard it from Kent that 1968 was a terrible year. Newsweek magazine put out a year ago a separate magazine on the 60s. And in that magazine, they have one section on 1968. They call it the year of horror. It is classified as one of the worst years, if not the worst year, since the Korean War. Um, that tells you about everything, about where we came from. We arrived in campus knowing that we were 18. We could go to war and die, but we couldn't vote. We got the right to vote in June of 1970. We could go to war and die, but we could not drink. Drinking age was 21. This campus would not allow any student to drink, supposedly, <laughs> unless you went off to uh, off into the woods and had your, your kegs. But otherwise, this was not allowed. So it wasn't until also 1970 before we got the administration to agree to allowing for people that were 21 to drink. Up until that time, no student was allowed supposedly to drink on campus. In the fall of 1968, we were still doing panty raids at St. Ben's. 
There was no inner school uh, classes. There was hours that we had to fight over to open up the dormitories to allow the ladies in. The judicial system here on campus had to be revised. We had issues all over the place. And what happened is that with what was going on, the election of Nixon and Spiro Agnew in the fall, November of 1968, was a real turning point for many of us. It was like, not only were our heroes gone, but also politically speaking, we were in another world and we all rebelled. No matter what our ethnicity or whether or not we were from the Twin Cities or whether or not we were from Pequot Lakes, Minnesota, we were still roughly probably 80 or 85, maybe more percent from Minnesota. We probably had only 2% of those of different ethnicities than ourselves. So very much I fit in, but very much we were educated to the point and, and had the knowledge to know that times had to change. And we did that. We really went after it in 1969, 1970, 1971. Thanks, David. Nancy? Hi, I'm Nancy Frost Belmont. I graduated in the class of 1974. I wanted to say thank you, first of all, to St. John St. Ben's and Professor Smith and uh, Professor Jones and Professor Larkin for um, hosting this event and inviting us here. I, I think it's a real gift to the colleges, to the people who are in the chairs and might be watching online, but it's also a real gift to me personally because like what old person doesn't love to reminisce, especially in front of an audience, you know, <laughs> it's a great night. Um, when I matriculated to come to St. Ben's, the, the student population was about 500. Our class that freshman year was over 300. And the class ahead of us was uh, smaller than ours, but larger than the other two classes. So it was the beginning of a new trend at St. Ben's where they were uh, expanding enrollment. Our class and the class ahead of us were not um, real rule followers. And uh, we fit right in with the times of rebellion and of pushing the limits. Um, we engaged in a lot of shenanigans, um, got ourselves in <laughs> some innocent trouble. But um, I think along the way, uh, St. Ben's was, well, I know it was a good place for me to grow up. Um, there was a steady hand. Uh, there, was, uh, there were rules, but it seemed like sometimes they got bent a little bit when they needed to be. Um, I came from the state of Iowa, so I find it interesting that uh, three of the four of us came from out of state, even though I would agree that at the time we were definitely in the minority. Most of the students here were definitely white, rural Minnesota. I don't know if there's anything else that would be important. It'll come out later, I think. Go ahead. Uh, Nancy, you wanted to, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, your point about uh, growth, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, in six years, St. Ben's tripled in size. So think about that kind of ramification and, and the power that that probably gave to the, to the younger groups mm -hmm. in that, that sense. Pat, I uh, wanted to go back and, and start with my, my first point about the, this idea of what education is for, and you were heavily involved in, in thinking about what, what students ought to be able to do in terms of their curricular activities, and if you'd talk a little bit about people's attitudes on that and your, I will. <laughs> your engagement there. I told, I, I told you about the first year I was here, 1966. After that, things changed dramatically because Dr. Stan Exerta became the first male uh, president of the college. And things changed very fast, very dramatically at St. Ben's. Among them, the student engagement in the education system. I was, I was on the educational policies committee for the college. Um, more uh, interdisciplinary coursework. Um, by the time I was a junior, we were, many of us were involved in um, what was then called the tri-college program. And that was a program from St. John, St. Ben's, and St. Cloud State. Um, and it was an interdisciplinary course. 
Um, and in our case, um, we were working on um, what communal living looked like and what that was, what, how that it was involved in, in, the, in the United States. So we studied communes, we did a number of things. And the group that I was in became the second, what we called the CEP, Community Education Project. Um, and that was a project, I was in the second group. The first group was a project where there were Johnny's and Benny's living together uh, down in Collegeville uh, with a faculty um, advisor and with at least one, and in our case that there, were, there was one each semester course that we developed ourselves um, based on what we felt we needed to learn to live together and to look forward to the world that we were uh, in. Um, so I guess I, that, that was probably the, one of the best experiences that I had, but we also at that time, um, and I don't, I don't even know if you still have the 414 program, Not the anymore. interim no. program, no. we went from a very traditional, you know, four or five, uh, uh, courses a semester to what was called the 414 program. So you had four courses and then you had one cement, one month where you had one course all day long and a whole variety of options. That just, that, that enlivened this campus like mm -hmm. I think nothing else. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it went from pretty rigid academics to very much hands-on and lived experiences. Um, whether it was learning how to organize, uh, which some of us did in the leadership courses, or learning, um, d doing spontaneous theater, uh, or going down to the Twin Cities and watching Firehouse Theater, which was a very avant-garde theater down there, and learning myth through theater. I mean, it was um, it was very, very much uh, an opening for um, many of us here at the at the colleges, both males and females. Um, so I would say that combination of uh, inter interdisciplinary work, uh, the opportunity to uh, create our own courses where we looked at how to, what was, we wanted to know um, what we studied, we wanted to have application to how we were living. And, and that's why the, the community education project, you know, became so important to um, both the first CEP, um, which uh, those folks graduated in 69, and then the rest of us, um, we graduated in 70, but we were very connected um, um, and, and learned a lot from each other um, and attempted to, um, attempted to develop a way for others to follow us, which meant that they had to be on campus. There wasn't, there wasn't room for us on campus. We had to go off campus, and we tried to convince the administration there ought to be, you needed more apartments anyway. You needed more dorms anyway. You might as well make them communal living situations or at least a, a diverse living situations. Um, and that didn't happen for a long time. Um, so the, the whole communal living situation sort of died down after we left. But... Um, We'll never forget it. And in the summertime, some of us lived together anyway. And then subsequent to graduation, some of us lived together in those kinds of situations because it had such an impact on us, both the living together, but the, the, the learning, the academic work, you know, combined with what we were doing. We were pretty purpose-driven, <laughs> not money-driven. Pat, the, the paper trail says that there were lots of other students who wanted to do another round of CEPs. You want to say a, a word or two about why that didn't happen? Why you guys were the last ones allowed to do that? Yep, because, because there wasn't room on campus. And for them to go off campus, which is the way we had to go, we went and we had, our, we had two apartments um, in Avon. We were renting from you know, a private donor. That, that meant that that money didn't come back to the college. And we couldn't convince the administration at the time that they ought to, they ought to build it here <laughs> and you know develop those different living arrangements. Mm -hmm. And so based on that, and also, you know, you, you can imagine some of the 
uh, ideas that went around about what was going on in those communes. And, and as a matter of fact, I would suggest it was as uh, ethically moral as what was happening in a lot of dorms. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So <laughs> anyway. One of the articles that you wrote for the student magazine talks about the that gossip is what determined the the demise of the CEPs that that the administration was willing to to listen to the gossip about when, what young men and young women were doing uh, rather than paying attention to reality. So, <laughs> uh, Chester, can you expand a bit on what was happening, especially as more Black students arrived on campus and how they were responding to some of the frustrations that they experienced? Sure. So I um, I came here in 68 and um, I was um, at that time, I was the only black student from the city of St. Louis attending St. John's. And uh, we had a connection with a program. Uh, well, I came up through a program called Sophia House. It was one run by um, two Jesuit seminarians from St. Louis University who had attended St. John. Both of them had attended St. John's and uh, Sophia sent um, me to St. John's and I was here. And then later on, a couple of other of my friends came up to St. John's. And then the following year, seemed, I, I think by the time I graduated, it must have been maybe about 15 or 20 people from St. Louis here at the time. And um, as more black students came on campus, I mean, this is, this is true wherever you have um, a place that's not really used to integrating or hasn't prepared for integration. One person, cool. Um, a couple, all right. Whoa, you guys are reaching a reaching critical mass here. We don't know what that, we, we don't know what you're doing. We think you're not trying to take over. I'm like, we're not trying to take over. We just want to get this education and, and you know, we want the same things you want. Um, but there was this, this fear and um, misunderstanding. Um, while I was here at St. John's, I had three roommates. All of my roommates were white. One was from Holdingport, one was from Duluth, and one was from Valley City, North Dakota. So, I, you know, I had a variety of experiences myself. Um, I know that other black students prefer to live with black students. Um, I was different and that, um, you know, I participated in a lot of the black events when the black students took the president's office in 1970, was it 70 or 71? 70, 70. 1970. Um, I was informed of it, but I didn't participate in the takeover. I can say after reading Dr. Jones's article about that, that and to my surprise, even though I was here at the time, um, most of the students that were involved in that were freshmen and sophomores, and the majority of them were from St. Louis. I was like, wow, I didn't, whoa, where was I? I was here, but I wasn't there. Um, and uh, there was a reason for that as well, because we came from a uh, working class background, um, many of us were not Catholic. Um, we had, we were struggling for our rights in St. Louis and we were doing the same things uh, simultaneously here at St. John's. So it was not unusual for us to be um, struggling for our rights or fighting for our rights and asking for improvements along those lines. So I can also say that when I looked at the number of students who went into the president's office and even the, uh, well, the number of students that went in, a number of them did not graduate from St. John's to St. Ben's. They did not come back to the school. I don't think they were expelled. They just didn't come back after that. Um, so I know that was a really, and it was a difficult thing. It was a difficult decision to make to go in. It was a difficult decision to make when people were offered the opportunity to say, you will not go to jail if you come out now. And some people left and some people who stayed felt like, they might have been betrayed because, you know, we all came into this together. We should all leave together or stay together. Um, so there was, you know, there was some difficulty around that. Um, and it, it was a complicated situation. I think that the takeover, um, even though a lot of people thought it was like, oh, you guys are just, you're trashing our school. You're making us look bad in the national press. You know, you're making St. John's isn't used to things like this. I don't think they really fully understood the uh, experience of being black in America. 
And I think that caused some consternation among some of the white classmates in terms of why did you do this? How could you do this? Look at what we've done for you type thing. Thanks very much. Um, can you, uh, just for students or people who don't know what the demands were, what was it that the students were after that sent them into the president's office? People were really wanting to have an expanded recognition of who we were at, on, at the school. We wanted courses that would be relevant to black people. We wanted black professors. And there were, there were other requests as well. I, I think the school thought that by doing some, mm, some window dressing every now and then, they might have a, a black lecturer come in for a week, but we wanted more. We wanted, we wanted classes. We wanted African-American history classes. We wanted a black professor. I, I don't think there was an unusual or unreal demand. I think that my uh, white classmates really had the luxury of seeing somebody teaching them who looked like them every day. You know, and we were merely saying, hey, you know, like, we'd like that opportunity. You know, we'd like to have a teacher or teachers who represent us that are familiar with our culture, who, um, you know, will, will take the time and see us. And one thing that I think um, a lot of black people felt at the time that we were at St. John's is invisible. Even though we're very visible, we felt invisible and that we weren't reflected in, the, in the, a lot of the values at the school. I, you know, and I think, so was it intentional? Mm, probably, but I don't think people thought it was intentional. I think people were saying, well, this is how we, this is how we roll. You know, what's your problem? And people would say, you know, if you don't like it, why don't you leave? You know, and the, you know, like, I'm, I'm not leaving. I've got a lot invested here. I mean, I, I, I thought myself, I, I deserve to be here as much as anybody else. You know, uh, my family has been in America longer than a lot of white families have been in America. And, you know, you know, they invited me in. If I didn't belong here, they would have sent me home or they wouldn't have accepted me. So it's a lot like I got accepted and sa they said, you're gonna be at this school because we just wanna be something nice and kind for you. You know, it was like, no, your, your grades, maybe they're not the greatest, but we, we believe in you and we think you can do it. And, you know, so I think, you know, the, the demands were not unreasonable. And I think that um, people felt this kind of uh, tension about being here, but not being really accepted to be here. So there was that, that, that tension there. Um, I have a couple of comments here. Um, I w as being the student government president in 1970, I was kind of in the middle of a lot of this. And uh, we were impatient. Uh, more impatient than even anyone, any group of people I've ever met in my life. I mean, students are impatient anyway, but um, when that happened in the fall of 1970, by the fall of 1971, there was Father Gopal. Do you remember him, mm -hmm. the Jesuit yeah. priest? Yeah. And I took an African-American course in the fall of 1971. Mm -hmm. So it isn't like St. John's uh, didn't react. They couldn't react timely for us students. I mean, that's what happened. Mm. So when we're, you know, having issues, uh, if I can expound on that. So, for instance, during 1970, uh, there was a uh, African American Culture Day that was scheduled for like the end of April or early May. I don't know the exact date of 1970, and both campuses were shut down for that for that day. So the administration knew how to cooperate and agree to that because we requested and the OOAS which is the organization of African-American African -American students. students. Yeah. Um, they, that's what they requested and we mm -hmm. supported it. But what happened was only about 150 students from both campuses took part during that day. There was a general uh, malaise, naivete. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't that big of an issue. Uh, I'm from Pequot Lakes, Minnesota, or I'm mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. South Dakota or North Dakota. and. I don't see how that really affects me. So that went over badly. I mean, that day was put aside and it went over badly because we didn't all participate, meaning the general population of both schools. That wasn't good. We had a, um, we had a moratorium on May 4th of 1970 was when Kent State, the four students were killed. 
Uh, four days before that, uh, Nixon announced and sent in to troops into Cambodia. So on late on November 4th in the evening, both student governments from both campuses and St. Cloud State decided to have a march in St. Cloud on March on May 5th. We all know that. Well, the school allowed to have no classes that day. So on short notice, as the administration understood how serious this was and allowed us to go who, who wanted to and, and provided buses to go into St. Cloud for that march. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they knew somewhat how to co coordinate with us and cooperate with us, but to get a African-American professor on campus, that wasn't gonna happen overnight. That wasn't gonna happen in the spring of 1971, but they were able to do it by the fall of 1971. That was a big deal, but it was kind of too late, if you would, for our, our students. Yeah. And this was a continual thing that went on throughout uh, the year. The African, the OOAS again, met with the student government in like October or something of right before the November event, the, the sit-in at the president's office and requested from the student government for funds. And the student government gave them min minuscule funds. It wasn't anywhere near what they wanted. They wanted a cultural center. They wanted $10,000 for, for a, a, an event. And so it wasn't small things, but it wasn't something that they were really given a serious response to. So when they did the sit-in, that got everyone's attention, without a doubt. Nine out of the, well, Kent, you know more about this than I do, I think. I mean, I've looked at it more recently. Yes, Let's put it that way. Recent, yeah. But I think nine out of 18 were arrested and jailed and yeah. something like that. And it was decided, you know, after the event that no uh, prosecution would occur related to these students, that basically everyone would part ways and they were punished enough and move forward. Well, I think that was a big deal on, on everybody's part, but it did highlight just how far the division was. Just thought I'd add that. Hmm? David, while you're going, you want to talk about the, the war side a little bit more? Um, yes. Without a doubt, because that really, uh, along with civil rights, the Vietnam defined our generation. Those two things were first and foremost, no matter where you were from in the country. And so, so what matters there the most is the fact that we knew that without a college exemption, we were going to be drafted and we were going to go to war or Vietnam. So what took place for all of us is that we wanted to stay in college. We took it pretty serious. We were going to do things socially and move things along that we could, but we weren't going to jeopardize that education. When it finally came down to push comes a shove, we were going to go to class, and we were going to get our grades, and we were going to stay in. I believe it was December 1, 1969 was the first um, lottery of the 366 numbers that then took effect in 1970. You have to picture a bunch of 18, 19 year old kids. Yeah, in 1969, we were 19-year-old. We're in our dormitories. There's no, remember, the only TVs were in the little study hall rooms. <laughs> there was no TVs. There's no computers, no iPads. There's no phones. I mean, we have uh, four or five stations. Like, we didn't have much. There's no cable TV. So we're all in our different study halls throughout the campus watching as the numbers are pulled out and announced. And I thought for the longest time I had the lowest number until one of my buddies called me today, G.T. Mers, and said he was 18, I was 25. So I knew I was headed for the service. What that meant was if you wanted to go to the service, that was fine. If you did not, you only had a couple of choices. I did file for a conscientious objector status, a CO status. That takes a tremendous amount of time and effort and paperwork. The paperwork, which I kept, is well over an inch thick in order to submit that. Um, so many of us were involved in that. So it wasn't like, well, okay, we're also watching the TV. We're seeing people die. We have friends that are involved in this. It was very personal. Couldn't be any more personal. Either you went to Canada, which was a legitimate concept for us northern Minnesota guys. <laughs> that, was, that was definitely on the playing table. Or you got a CO status and you were a paramedic or you went into the service. So that was very important that that was going on. On campus, we were pretty equally divided. We, and this is very important and should never be forgotten. There is a value to the ROTC on campus. 
with the ROTC on campus, we knew those individuals. They were a pretty good class act, to be honest. You know, they were certainly clean cut, whereas all the rest of everybody else was pretty long haired and, you know, with some hippies here. So we had about one third of the campus on the far left. We had about one third of the campus on the far right. We had about one third in the middle independent with left leanings, which was me. That's always where I've been. And so I was able to work with people like Chet, you know, did too. But it was important to understand that we didn't have the sense of uh, violence or intensity that some other college would have that did not have a relationship with their ROTC students. McAllister College is my example. They didn't have ROTC on campus. They were unified in their approach to go marching or picketing or whatever they wanted to do because they were unified in that approach. On this campus, we were not unified except that we believed that we were all students. We all had a right to be here. We understood the respect we would each give. Yes, we were vocal. Yes, we didn't agree. But we didn't ever get uncivil to each other or to anyone else. I think that speaks volumes of this campus. You get locked in behind the pine curtain and you can't have a car for at least the first two years, was it? So it wasn't anywhere you're gonna go. You had to be here, you had to enjoy it, you had to study, you had to pay attention to the outside world, but you still had to live with everybody else here. That is what made the biggest difference for me related to the Vietnam War and how we got through it on campus. Thanks, David. Nancy, can you take us through uh, some of the gender assumptions or the sexism or how Title IX changed campus for you? Yeah, I, so uh, I, I found your comment, Dave, about the two main issues revolving around racism and the war to be incredibly intriguing because for a lot of us, uh, women's issues were bigger and still are today. Uh, so it, it, it's a reflection of those times. It's still a reflection today of a lot of attitudes. Um, but I, I was fortunate enough to um, grow up and live through a time when um, women did make a lot of gains. Uh, one of the main things that happened while I was on campus is that my senior year, we had our first intercollegiate uh, sports team. It was basketball. 73 to 74, we were terrible. Uh, but we had our first opportunity ever to play sports and it meant the world to us. Um, there was one state tournament, all of the colleges that had a women's team were in the same mix. Uh, it was the luck of the draw with the brackets and our first game was against the U of M. It, did, it didn't go well. Come on. <laughs> no, Man. well, and they did not win the tournament. Um, you know, St. Cloud State had a really strong women's program, so did Winona State, so did Mankato. But the U of M did not win that tournament. But, you know, every program was in its infancy, and ours was the most infant of all at that time. But, you know, if you, if you consider that for a person like myself to go to what St. Ben's has today and um, what girls and women are around the country have grown to, um, expect, you know, nobody would ever be able to conceive anymore of a day when a girl couldn't go play soccer or couldn't go play basketball, uh, when a um, high school student couldn't go out for a volleyball team. That's the norm now. But if you can, just try to think about what it was like to be the only person on campus who owned a pair of sweats and went for a jog. That was me. Mm -hmm. Um, women were not exercising, women were not competing. There were all kinds of cockamamie ideas thrown at us about why we shouldn't compete. Mainly, we were going to ruin our reproductive organs. And um, it's, you know, you know, it sounds like dark ages, doesn't it? But that, that was mm -hmm. part of my life. I got told that by a high school chemistry teacher took me aside because some of us were playing basketball after school in the gym. Um, but a lot of other um, things, you know, gains that women have made. My first job out of college came because of the fact that there was a federal grant that 
aimed to provide employment opportunities for minorities and women in careers that had traditionally been closed to them. So I became the first uh, probation officer, female probation officer in Stearns County. I was one of a handful in the state because it was a traditionally male position like firefighter and police and lawyers and dentists that are now you know, wide open to women. But then it was, um, it was new, it was different. And I would never have gotten the job with, without that uh, federal grant program. There are those that didn't agree with it because you know I was taking a job away from a man, a breadwinner. I was, um, I was told in the workplace by other employees that it was wrong, that I was earning the same pay as the men because I didn't have a family to support. I wasn't a breadwinner. Nobody would ever conceive of that in the workplace anymore. I know there are disparities with wage and income, but it was, but it, but it's not thrown in your face like it was then. This is just different. We've come a long ways, and I'm grateful for that. Thanks. I'm just going to ask one last question, and then I want to uh, get to a lot of the good questions that we have in the audience. But if we could just go down the line, David, you could start us and just um, help us understand how you think participating in activism or demonstrations has had a lasting impact on your life, how it changed you as a person. Um, well, St. John's changed me as a person, and being involved in the student government did the most. The student government, um, I made a comment to my grandson the other day that I think adults really have one main goal in life, and that is to be conflict managers. I think that's when it's all said and done is what we do all day long, whether it's with work or family or friends, or, and I still believe that. So I learned how to manage conflict at, at St. John's. So that was very important to me. I also realized, and I think it's still true today, is that if you work with uh, any entity, and in this case, the administration of St. John's, and if you uh, get them to agree, get both parties to agree that this is the goal of the purpose, this is the end result we want. I'll give the example of, you know, we got them to agree that, uh, yeah, the law is 21. We had a legal opinion from the Hughes Law Firm for drinking, and therefore we should be allowed to drink on campus. That, that seemed to be sensible. They, really no argument about, well, if you can drink 21 everywhere else, why can't you do here? Then once you get them to agree on that or take a day off for whatever purpose or have a program or have reasonable dorm hours, whatever it is, then it's just a matter of figuring out the strategy that when is it implemented, how many hours for dorm hours, whatever the issue. So I would tell you that what I learned really uh, at St. John's was uh, how to work with people, how to work with all sides, come up with the purpose of goal, and then get everyone basically in the same page related to that, and then determine the strategy to make it effect. I think that's still the solution today for many of our problems, and I didn't learn that at home. I learned that at St. John's. <laughs> I, I would second that. Um, I was trying to explain earlier the sense of possibility that happened between my freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year, and the amount of change that we were able to um, manage here. Um, we, we, we reorganized our entire student council at, at St. Ben's at the time. Um, we were able to make changes in the way courses were done, in the way um, student uh, uh, student. Um, uh, places to be were. We didn't have those prior to that. Um, there were just so many changes we were able to make um, by working together and being very um, precise about what it is we were trying to accomplish and not getting lost in the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest. And remembering that sometimes it takes, you know, to go two steps back for us to live in the community education project, we had to live in two separate apartments. We were living, however, in a communal situation. We were, we were not getting lost in the trees. We were looking at the forest, the bigger picture. That, and, and that seemed, um, along with the, the notion of 
this is about you know what makes for a meaningful life <laughs> and 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 to have a, the, a kind of um respect for one another and respect for those who were not interested in what we were doing but recognizing that at the same time they lived in the same place so um my experience um, in 35 years in a system in St. Cloud um, and the last nine years working for a foundation in St. Cloud around social equity has been similar to that, that experience, that um, being more clear about what it is you're trying to accomplish, persisting, working together, um, you can make change. And it's worth it if, if it is about meaningful purpose. And I learned that, I think, at St. Ben's. Okay, um, so what I think I've learned about St. John's, one, one important thing I learned is the concept of community and being a part of the, the Black Student Association, uh, also known as the Organization of African-American Students, and also living on the international floor for one year, um, just taught me the basics of the importance of community. And as uh, several panelists have mentioned, the ability to, you know, make that effort to compromise and try to seek that common good with each other. And um, just currently in my work as a therapist, I, um, I do this with my clients. I try to see where they are. I try to recognize their humanity. I try to, and I try, I acknowledge their humanity. Um, one thing I learned from my mom, also uh, from my time at St. John's and St. Finn's with, with students, was being able to reach out and, you know, appreciate diversity. Get to know people who are different than you. If you have an opportunity to talk to somebody who has a different opinion than you, engage with them. Um, I often tell a lot of white people, like, you know, when black people start to tell you about our pain and our hurt, listen, tomorrow morning, you're still gonna have power. You'll still be white, <laughs> you know, don't run away because it's not gonna hurt you, all right? And no, nobody's trying to blame you or shame you. We just want to be heard. And in that way, people sharing their humanness with one another I mean, I certainly have had women talk to me about um, uh, sexism, and I'm not going to say I'm not sexist. I'm, you know, I was raised in America. So, yeah, I am. You know, I'm guilty as charged. I try not to act it out. I try to keep it under wraps. I mean, you know, I try to see the, the humanness in the, in the women that I know. So uh, I just think I learned uh, from my mother, Bernice, and also from my time at St. John's and St. Ben's of recognizing the humanity of all of us. Well, my big takeaway from St. Ben's, my time here at St. John's and St. Ben's has to be um, a sense of community, for sure. Um, the sisters at St. Ben's really did a great job of instilling that in me. It was something new for me. Um, I think it's, you know, it's so important as community to um, find ways to work together, but also recognize and appreciate our differences. But it was also my experience that sometimes um, you gotta raise the rafters. You gotta get attention. <laughs> you gotta, um, you know, I was on the bus on the way over to St. John's and at the time, the main entrance to St. John's was the, a road that's closed now. It's where the pedestrian bridge goes across the freeway. And all the buses came in there, all the traffic came in there. And I was on the bus coming over for an early morning class and some students overnight, um, anti-war protesters had rolled logs across the road. We couldn't get into campus except to get off the bus and walk in. And it caused a bit of an uproar, as you might imagine. Um, some students chose uh, not to cross that line. Some of us chose to cross that line and go to class, but heard about it from the people who were out there protesting that day. It, it caused me to look differently at the whole issue of our involvement in the war at the time. 
Um, and I think sometimes civil disobedience has a place. And uh, I, I, I think it's unfortunate, but sometimes necessary because otherwise you just don't get heard and you just don't get noticed. And sometimes you just have to raise people's awareness. It's not an easy thing to do. It's difficult. It is hard to be the first female basketball official in a small town gym mm. where they think they need to tell you to go back to the kitchen where you belong. Mm. But sometimes you just have to do what's uncomfortable and stand up for what you know to be correct in order to get people to start to see things differently. It's worth the difficulty, it's worth the journey. You have to stay the course. You can't back down. Um, it's, it's, it's paying it forward for somebody else is what it really is. Mm -hmm. And that's really what community is all about. Thank you all so much. Uh, we have time for a few questions and I'm going to bring you the microphone because we want to make sure that everyone on Zoom can hear the question. So if there are, yes, please clap. <laughs> Questions? Thank you. So this is directed towards Pat. Um, housing is one of the forefront issues um, of life on campus, especially communally. So I think it's very interesting to hear that there was co-ed living once upon a time all these years ago. Um, I believe that that's one thing that if it got changed on campus would open doors to um, leveling the playing field across the genders and the cultures of the campus. Um, how do you feel that um, all these years later um, that is still not a possibility and that the housing is so gendered on our campuses? Well, you can imagine how I feel. I think it is, um it doesn't make sense that people aren't interested in providing diverse ways of living. Um, and for us, it really did level the playing field. And I think it woke a, a lot of us up to how difficult real communal living is, honestly. Um, at the same time, um, I was, on the one sense, living only with women and living on a women's campus that at the time was predominantly women. We had some classwork over here, but not much. Allowed for a whole lot of women to have leadership positions, which would not have probably been the course had it been totally co-ed. Um, now, that's different than living together. <laughs> so I guess I, I think it doesn't make sense not to have those, those opportunities. Um, I do think in our situation, you know, we chose to live that way and we had a purpose in doing it. Um, and um, we actually even developed, you know, a coursework around it, meaning we brought people in who, who talked about it in their various situations. We thought about it, we did it um, in meaningful ways. So I do think that that part is important if you're gonna um, do it in order to learn to live e with each other in a communal way. I'm shocked to learn that you don't have it because I know of other private colleges that do. Yeah. 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 All right. So, hi. Um, I'm Jim Platten, and I'm kind of with you guys. Dave, you talked about. Benedictine values as a core piece of St. John's and St. Ben's. And as we look at 2022 and the diminishing involvement by numbers of the monastics, I guess I'm curious as to how you see Benedictine values, you know, because I look at it all the time and I'm trying to figure it out myself. For the current population and the current communities, how does that play out? Because I think it had a huge impact on us because the majority of our faculty were monastic and now 
it's the exact opposite. I'd just be curious to get yeah. some thoughts. You're absolutely right. I have, I've had the opportunity to talk to five different students uh, today, one way or another, and that's been a question of, about have either of you or any of you had a monastic, a brother or monk as a professor in your years so far at school? None of them has had one. Now, that one student did list like uh, they knew of five monks or brothers that were teaching certain courses, but they had not taken. And I asked the same question of them. And they have what's called the Raven program here on campus, which uh, allows for a professor to bring in the Benedictine uh, core values in, in, in that course. And you actually have to have the professor agree, I guess, I don't know a lot about it, sign off on that Raven concept in order for it to be kind of determined that you've heard about them and uh, you know about them. So I think the campus is doing something. Um, I don't know if they're doing enough. That, that's one of those things where uh, I have been fortunate uh, lately uh, being around some St. John's uh, rugby players that, have, that are graduated. They're two, three, five years out. They certainly appear to have the same Benedictine values I know about role model, community, involvement without uh, pride. Um, so many of these values seem to be present. So I think it's occurring um, with no with with soon to be maybe no professors on either campus teaching or to the point where it's negligible. I think that there has to be as much effort possible to make that happen without it being overbearing. It's a very touchy situation, but I think it needs to be done because and I repeat this, I, I, I wasn't raised to be the person I am today. Uh, the most powerful influence on my life was my three and a half years at St. John's, which is why I'm here today. It's not about, you know, my law school or, or work or things of that nature. It is about the three and a half years I spent here and the involvement of the Benedictine monks and brothers. When you have them on your floor, as you know, and others, it's, uh, you cannot escape it. And when you have professors that talk about how you do fairness with constitutional law, it sticks with you. So I think they're still doing it, but it is an absolute fear that that gets lost as we become more and more a secular college. Hi, I'm happy to be here and happy to be listening to all of you. One of the big things that I noticed in what you're talking about is that Part of the reason these student movements were so successful is that they were able to join in with these huge broad currents happening across America at the time, you know, like anti-Vietnam War protests were huge across the U.S., you know, civil rights, you know, women's rights were huge. Um, and in connecting this to our current political landscape, there are so many things to have a movement about these days. You know, we can talk about politics. We can talk about still the racism that hasn't been addressed, still the gender equality that has not been not addressed. We can go further on the environmental things that Dr. Jones mentioned so briefly, but you know, we're going into this hugely, you know, there's so many things to be worried about. And my question for y'all is, did it feel like you know, you were joining a big stream of movement? And if so, how can we do the same now? How can we join in with broader movements and how can we unite the campus on something when we all have so many things to be worried about? Um, I'll just take a, um, a shot and then I'll invite other panelists to join in as well. But I think you have to start with that step. You gotta step with that, start with the first step. You know, when uh, we were on the campus, we didn't know we were living history at that time. At least I didn't, you know? I mean, I knew that there was something happening here, as they say in that, that old um, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young song. You know, what it is ain't exactly clear. But, you know, there's a man with a gun over there telling me I got to beware. I mean, I was like in the middle of history and not knowing that or really not really taking in and appreciating the full value of it. But you guys are all aware that you're a part of history now. I mean, the, the fact that you guys are here post-COVID, well, not post, I shouldn't say that, not post-COVID, but you've come during the pandemic and the pandemic appears to be subsiding. And that's historical, you know? Um, you, you start with that first step. You start with finding allegiances. What do you have common with other groups of people? I mean, I, I know that um, <clears throat> when Earth Day was first proposed as a black student, I was like, 
I'm skeptical of that. You know, we ain't got our civil rights yet. How am I going to be fighting for Earth Day? But I realize the importance of protecting the environment because there's environmental racism. If you look around the country, mm -hmm. the places with the dirtiest water, mm -hmm. the filthiest air mm -hmm. are in inner cities and reservations yeah. and in barrios. Yeah. Come on. Redlining. And redlining. All of those things are still happening, you know? I mean, yes, we contributed to trying to demolish some of that, you know, and now we're, uh, hopefully we paved the way for others to do that. Hopefully we paved the way for others to do it. So I'll invite others to answer as well. So I, I was really glad that you brought up music because music was so important to our generation while we're here and, um, and it touched on all these issues you know, the environment, women's rights, civil rights, mm -hmm. uh, poverty, um, the whole spectrum, the war, um, protest songs, songs that were lamenting, that were raising questions. And it, it did unite young people across the country. And maybe, I, I don't know, I don't know the answer to this question, but I often wonder, um, did the music reflect what was going on or did the music mobilize what happened? But I have a question for the students. What's your music about? I don't listen to Is there message music? Because our music was all about the message. I yeah. mean, yeah. over and over and over and over, all the top hits were m message i mean you had say it loud i'm black i'm proud you had aretha franklin's respect sam cook's a change is gonna come eve of destruction the eve of destruction and even destruction when that record came out it was so controversial if you can imagine this it was an anti-war song and it was so controversial it was <clears throat> banned from most radio stations yeah and you couldn't buy the record in the store. You had to find a black market source to buy the record. If you can imagine that, because um, somebody was singing out against <laughs> the war, then that's the climate that we lived in. And yet the music thrived. Well, you know, the other thing that we did, we had this kind of unifying thing in America at the time. Yes, the country was divided, but usually on Sunday nights when we were growing up, there was a show called The Ed Sullivan Show. And if you if you can see a rerun of the Ed Sullivan show, you'll see an amalgamation of America. OK, so at, at one time you'd see the Supremes on the Ed Sullivan show. And then the next act would be an opera singer. Right. And then the next act would be a clown from Italy. I mean, come on. Where you can get that amalgamation of people and everybody's talking about it the next day at school. Oh, I saw the Supremes. Oh, I saw the Beatles. You know, they were on the Ed Sullivan show. This, is, this show was like a unifying force. But as you pointed out, um, most people don't have this, like, they're split. You got, you got your own thing now. And there's not a unifying thing going on in the culture or the country. Um, and I don't know where most people get their news sources from. And people are different about, you know, whether they get it from a trusted news source or source they call a trusted news source. I don't know. You are, you are a distracted a group of individuals. You are so distracted with everything. You are so busy with everything. And at some point, uh, maybe a calamity will happen that will pull you together so that you can declare your priorities. Because you're gonna have to decide and filter through and say, this is a priority. An example is electric vehicles. Uh, I live in California, 9% now of the owners of cars are electric vehicles. They're putting up EV stations, battery powered, you know, stations all through the state. There is no reason in the world that this campus with all the cars that are here does not have that now, let alone next year. You need to figure out what the priorities are to help and you need to stop being so distracted. It's very difficult. Again, we didn't have all this. So for us, it was a lot easier to sit around in January and come up with ideas and commitments for for programs of what we wanted to do. You all are different, but you need to figure out how to take that communication and have some priorities and then make it happen, make it work. Or you will end up with the results and the results are not pretty. 
Our generation identified a great deal of stuff during the late 60s and 70s. That's great. We weren't able to accomplish a lot of the goals we set out. The majority of Americans are not us. And so our leadership positions that you represent has to be stronger. You have to go out there and represent and take care of these issues that we failed as a generation to solve. Because mm -hmm. they're all here back and forth. So mm -hmm. You know, they're similar but different. I was talking to someone today about the fact that, you know, we had divisions of right and left. The liberals thought that they could not trust the government. We now have a case where the right, the conservatives do not trust the government. It's the weirdest thing to see that after 50 years, that they're on opposite side and we are still divided. So I would encourage you to figure out how to simplify your lives, easy thing to say, prioritize it, and then make something happen. I was gonna ask if you feel the polarity that, that uh, he just described here. Most organizations yeah, okay. th that uh, out, out there feel that split, but you, you were talking about you know, having many, many things that are pulling you. Do you feel the polarity in the, in the, in the, in the country? And what, what do you think that's about? And how do you identify with any of it? <laughs> Good question. Thank you. I think on our campus, all the clubs have their own thing that they're super passionate about. Like, you know, Dee has done an amazing job with our current Black Student Union. And I work with Climate Justice Club, which does environmental justice. And Ryan back there, who cheered me on, is in Q+, right? We have all these different organizations that are doing awesome work. It just feels so hard sometimes. Even though we live in such a connected world, it feels so hard to interconnect mm -hmm. and to collaborate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and anyone who's involved in clubs and has felt you know, this disconnect can attest to this, that no matter how hard you're working to do your thing, it's still, it's still not included in the program sometimes to see what everyone else is up to and go to other people's events and work with them to create other events. And so often it happens that two clubs will have events on the same topic at the same time mm. on different campuses without even knowing the other existed. Mm. And where it could have been collaboration, it has been separated. And so the polar polarization doesn't really happen in, you know, active opposition to each other. It just happens in ignorance. It happens in disorganization. And that's kind of been the problem has been, okay, who's going to organize us? But you don't feel the, the disunity that is going on in the nation? Because it's great it's as far as the great. rural areas, the certain states, and you, you don't sense that or know how much how bad that is right now. I think it's incredibly bad, especially with the internet, because you cannot express an opinion without anyone having another opinion, and there's no way to properly um, have a discussion with other people through the internet. But that's where most of all this comes from. People are able to spread ideas so easily and without restriction that I think like the internet is one of the driving forces of polarity, especially with how available it is now. And since everyone's on it all the time, you cannot escape it because of how publicized it is, especially with news sources that are always um, pushing for like driving issues. And it kind of forces people to choose one side or the other. So that it leaves no space for discussion. So what you were saying, like on the campus, it's not as, like forcefully divisive, but I think in the nation in general it is, and you're not allowed to have like a middle ground and you have to pick one side or the other. Yeah, the only other thing I would add to what Ken said is people in general live in echo chambers and aren't willing to have um, respectful communication between opinions. And because of that, um, it seems like it's rare that we get any change or action for the issues that people have with what's going on in the world. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to say one of the most powerful things that you talked about in like having a ROTC presence on campus is that when you talk to people who had differing opinion, opinions from you, you were still all from CSB and SJU and you could still come back to that, that, story, that shared story that you had. 
Whereas now, if you are in the Democrats club and you want to argue with a Republican, you don't go to the college Republicans club. You go online and you go on a comment section and you go, oh, I hate Republicans. Vice versa for Republicans wanting to argue with Democrats will go on to a page in their own echo chamber that gets mad at some imaginary Democrat who believes all these terrible things and will rage on them. And so you don't have the shared story. And I think that has been one of our main problems with this, this hyper connection of the internet is it disconnects you from the people who you are actually physically around. Maybe it was my old ears sitting up here listening to the panelists, but it sounded to me like you guys had a lot of things to say about reaching out to people in a non-combative way, just simply trying to find out what what gets to somebody else, what matters to somebody else, what do you care about? I heard a lot of, of comments about finding out who the other person is and then trying to find something that you can work on. And I'm not saying that's easy, and I totally agree with you that, that our communication system has gotten us into a position where that's hard to do, but it seems to me that's still a pretty good strategy to, for breaking down those barriers. And, you know, we really need to work on that or we're just going to absolutely destroy ourselves. Uh, I think that we've actually, looking at time, we need to um, end the formal Tegeterberg Society event right now. So those who are online, if they uh, need to log off can do that and if there are folks here who need to uh you know catch a bus that they can do that i'm assuming that our panelists would love to uh continue this conversation and i'm very sorry to interrupt it uh but i do think that for the formal part uh we'll go ahead and end but if you want to if you still have questions if you want to continue the conversation please stay i highly encourage you to do it it sounds like the panelists uh, would want to have that conversation with you. Again, thank you for coming to tonight's Tegeter Berg Society event, and I look forward to seeing you at our event in the spring. So if you still have questions, please come.